Good morning and welcome to Grace Episcopal Church in Mansfield, Ohio. We gather as, as representatives of three local Central Ohio congregations, Grace Church, St. Matthew's Church in Ashland, and St. Mark's Church in Shelby, to celebrate the feast of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today's participants are myself, the Reverend Joe Ashby, Rector of Grace Church, the Reverend Kay Ashby, Rector of St. Matthew's, will be our celebrant, the Reverend Daniel Orr, the Associate for Mission and Food Pantry Directory, Director at Grace Church, and the Pastor for St. Mark's Church. And we have four intrepid souls from our choir who join us, our choir director, Lori Turner, Virginia Harmon, Diane Heberlin, and Patrick Kleinage, and our musician and film director is Nathaniel Pat. Again, we invite you to join us and sing along, but those of you in the, the three congregations should have received your bulletin, so we hope you participate fully as we worship and celebrate the risen Lord.
are dead. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Thanks be to God.
Glory to you, Lord Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter said to the other disciple, Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrap wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken she said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Lord. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord has risen indeed. Alleluia. That was a good job by those of you gathered here, but somehow it's not quite the same in an empty church. And, I can't, and besides that, I can't challenge you to do it more robustly as I would normally do. And in fact, I've even heard a few people who said, why are we even bothering? How can it be Easter without gathering in church to proclaim that Jesus is alive? To sing our familiar hymns, to smell the flowers, and know at the altar and receive the body and blood of Jesus. And while I think I know why we are still bothering to have a service, albeit in an empty church, and only available through, virtually through technology that many of us don't really understand, it can seem a little hot. Just going through the motions but without the substance and life-giving power of our traditional Easter celebrations. And yet, I cannot imagine not being here. There's something of a paradox there. How important it is to be here even if it doesn't feel quite right. How important it is in the midst of the experiences we are all sharing now to speak of resurrection. Give thanks to God for the re 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 resurrection of his son. 
But as I was thinking about this, I was reminded from a, of a scene from one of my favorite movies. The movie is in character win. And I highly recommend it for viewing while you're cooped up. I actually look and you can get it from several different sources. You may remember it's a movie that is technically about the Scopes monkey trial, the fight over Darwinism and evolutionism. But at the same time, it was actually written as a way to challenge the anti-intellectualism of the McCarthy area, era of the 1950s. And in my favorite scene, Spencer Tracy, who plays the lawyer who defended Bertram Cates, a young East Tennessee high school teacher who was on trial for teaching Darwinism. Tracy tries to explain to the opposing counsel why this trial is so important. And he does it by telling a story from his childhood. The two men are sitting in rocking chairs on the front porch of the hotel in the small town where the trial is being held. And Tracy starts out and says, Golden Dancer, I can still remember her. I was convinced that if I had Golden Dancer, I would have everything I would ever want. She was a beautiful rocking horse. And at seven years old, I was an authority on rocking horses. She had a bright red mane, big blue eyes, and she was gold all over with beautiful purple spots. Every day I would stand in front of the display window at the Wakefield, Ohio General Store and look longingly at her at her. But I knew she would never be mine. Golden Dancer cost as much as my father made in a week, so there was always a plate glass window between Golden Dancer and me. Then it happened. And since it wasn't Christmas, so it must have been my birthday. I woke up, and as I sat up in bed, I couldn't believe my eyes. There, at the foot of my bed, was Golden Dancer. Later, I found out that Mother had taken in laundry, and Dad had worked extra night shifts for a month to get the money. But all I cared about then was that Golden Dancer was mine. And I jumped out of bed and left into the saddle, Golden Dancer slipped right down the middle. The wood was rotten. Golden Dancer was all spit and polish, held together by glue and wax. I think one of the reasons this story has such power for me this week is that while proclaiming the resurrection to be the central truth of our faith, and the source of life for God's people is always a proclamation of what is true, what is real, what is solid and whole in the world. Somehow it seems that this week, and in the life world in which we're currently living, we need to hear this story because we, we see a world in which we and others, and maybe even ourselves, if we're honest, have put our trust and faith in golden dancers. Institutions or ideals or traditions that ultimately crumble and break when pressure is exerted on them. And yes, this seems to be even more the case this year in the midst of the pandemic which separates us and in the midst of other pressures that challenge our understanding of what is solid, where we can stand without fear. Think about it. Just a few weeks ago, the stock market was at an all-time high. Unemployment was low. And even though there was concern over the vitriolic and divisive political rhetoric gripping our country, if we're really honest, most of us felt pretty good. And no matter which side of the political fence you were on, and whatever you might think of President Trump, most analysts said he would be likely to be reelected because of the success of the economy. And how things have changed in a short period of time. The pandemic hit, social distancing became the word of the day. And while many of us are hopeful that our economy will recover, we can no longer feel so secure. The world seems less safe. There are members of this congregation who are no longer working. And we wonder what will happen if the pandemic continues into the summer or the fall. How many of us will be unemployed? 
And many of us are afraid of such simple tasks as going to the grocery. We are afraid that our health system will not be able to withstand the pressure of the pandemic. We are afraid that we will lose people who are important to us. It seems that the things we have depended upon have been yanked from under our feet, or that they've broken under the pressure of this reality. And we at Grace Church have had another challenge this week that in a sense seems the same way. Another pressure that questions what we can depend on. By now, most of you have probably heard that our church was broken into and were vandalized last week. The good news is, you can see by the fact that we are here in the church, that the church proper was not damaged other than to be being coated with the residue from the fire extinguishers that the perpetrators set off. And there is more good news. We have recovered almost all the property that was taken. And our insurance company is working with us to complete the necessary cleaning and repairs. We will be all right. One might even say that if it had happened, it had to happen. It was a good time that it happened when we couldn't be in church anyway. And yet we have been violent. It hurts. And it's only reasonable to ask the question, is nothing safe? Even though we can't be in our beloved church, we need to know that it is safe, safe and humble. It seems like just one more thing that can't be depended on. One more way in which our world feels dangerous and uncertain. As I thought about this, I realized that in many ways, the world in which we find ourselves today had a lot of parallels to the world in which Mary Magdalene, the women, and the disciples in today's gospel lesson, the story of the resurrection, were experiencing. Think about it. We had the advantage of hindsight. But if you were living in that moment, think about the world that those women were experiencing. It seemed that there was nothing they could depend on, no solid ground. The man, Jesus, whom they had loved and followed and believed to be the Messiah, was dead. Did this mean that they had been wrong? Who could they believe and trust? What could they believe if not in Jesus? What would happen to them now? Would the Jewish and Roman authorities come to arrest them for having been followers of Jesus? Would they be the next to die? It had to be a very frightening world, and one which made no sense. And yet they came to the tomb. Not because they expected a miracle, that automatically pops into our minds but because it is all they could do, they came to anoint the body of the one whom they had loved and believed in, because this is what faithful Jewish women did. And now this. The rock has been rolled away and the temple is empty. There's nothing sacred. Could they not even leave this body? I said, so it is for us today. We gather here today, even if only by YouTube or Facebook, because we want to find strength and comfort in our traditions, in what we have always done. And yet now the building that has been so important, such an important part of our life in Christ, has been violated. Is not even this sacred space safe? Just as Mary runs away from the tomb, back to find Peter and John, so it is tempting to run away from this place. Believe me, I've had that experience this week. But it's in that moment that they run away and then come back to the tomb that the transformation begins, the miracle. It is that moment when they turn to each other for hope and strength and understanding, trying to find a way to, to, to make sense of their world. The miracle begins. And when they return to the tomb, Mary does the second essential act. When all the others leave, unsure and questioning about what has happened, she stays. 
Even in her bewilderment and her fear and pain, she stays. Even when Peter and John and the other women leave, she stays there, waiting, hoping against hope that somehow that which she thought was real was not a hoax. That it was not a falsehood, not another golden cancer, if you will. And the miracle happens. Jesus calls her by name. She knows the truth. He is not dead. He is alive. He is not an imposter of spin and polish. He is real. He is the Son of God, the Messiah, and nothing else really matters. So it is for us. The call during this time of fear and loss, when nothing seems solid, is to share our lives with one another. To listen and draw strength from one another, to hear the faith of the other when our own faith is being challenged. To get on the phone, to find a way to connect with others. And to share even our sense of frustration and our fears. To be honest about it. And then we're called to stay in this place in the garden with an empty tomb, in a building where the offices look like Armageddon and the air is out. We are called to stay and to live into and understand more deeply that there are no shortcuts, that life only comes through death, and to wait for Jesus to make himself known to us once more, to call us by name and give us that gift of knowing really knowing, not just intellectually, or because it's what we've always been told, or because it is our religious tradition, but knowing that we have met the risen Lord. Knowing that this is the one who will never split and crumble beneath us, like golden cats. To know that Jesus really is alive, even in the midst of this pandemic, even in this, in this time in which we're hurting because of the vandalism and violation of this space, Know that he will always walk with us, even into the deepest and darkest moments of our lives. And no matter what happens, he will be there. And he will bring life, new life, real life. To know that the love of the one who died for us truly is, as St. Paul says, the strongest power in all creation. And that nothing, nothing can separate. This is why we're gathered here today. A few of us in this empty building, some of us in our living rooms, or some of us maybe even in bed. This is why the Great Church Food Pantry went on as usual Wednesday and Thursday this week. It was an opportunity to proclaim that Jesus is alive, that he is with us even in the midst of our fears and dangers and the darkness around us. That his love is the solid foundation of our life, and this love is what we will share with our neighbors and the world around us. We are proclaiming that we will allow this love to continue to shape and mold us, that we will continue to share this love even when it may not make sense to many, that we will be Jesus' followers who work with justice and mercy and respect and love. This is why today at grace, we pray even for and maybe even especially for those who have harmed us so deeply. We ask Jesus to make himself known to them, that they might know as we do that this is the truth that will never split and collapse under our feet. The proclamation that Jesus is risen is not a golden dance. It is the truth. Jesus is dead, and now he lives. And because of this, we are truly alive. And this is what we mean when we proclaim our ancient words. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.
Let us continue as we stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through whom in all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and the same man. For our sake he was crucified under the conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the cross. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father of life, we give you praise and glory. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. You have given Jesus victory over sin. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. You have raised him from the dead. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. You have made this cross a sign of glory. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. You have made us shares in your life. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. With Christ, you have buried us in death to sin. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. With him you have raised us to new life. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He is seated with you in glory. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He sends his spirit to guide our lives. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Jesus will come again in glory. Christ, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and open to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we, who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection, may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Again, just very short announcements. We, we are glad that you could join us today. We look forward to the day when we will celebrate the Easter message together. We, we ask you to continue to support one another in prayer, in phone calls, in letters, and to support the church, remembering discerning your pledges of being charitable givers as we walk through this time together, secure in the resurrected. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
It is right to give God thanks, thanks and praise. praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.